Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's going to be a little bit interesting, maybe a little bit tedious. I tried to do lots of the tedious work for us in doing all the math stuff, but we're going to go over it and um, we'll talk about it. So let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this day, uh, for the time that we have again this morning, precious morning hours um, in which we can open your word together and begin our day. We just ask for your spirit to be here in our midst, to teach us, to correct us, to guide us, and to give us light for our feet. And we pray for each person that you can help them in their daily struggles, and that you can watch over them, that your angels may protect them. And uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful to you in all that we do and to reflect your character. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning again, everyone. Yesterday we had... Uh, started looking at the gematria of these names and uh, so we're going to look at this here I have this chart oops you see here at the bottom I'm just going to move it up just so some people might have an easier time seeing it <clears throat> now so what we did is we were we're trying to place this this story, what it means uh, in this Song of Deborah. And there's this section, verses 14 to 18, that's going to con contain the names of all these different tribes. And so when we looked at, at this, uh, we saw that um, there was significance in, for instance, Deborah and Barak in the, the Hebrew numbers. Um, and, and then we, we put the Hebrew numbers for Benjamin and Eph, Ephraim and Mech, Machir and Issachar, Reuben, Dan, Gilead, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and then uh, Manasseh. Now, Manasseh is not directly named in these verses, but both Gilead and Machir, because Machir's a descendant of Manasseh, is of the tribe of Manasseh, and Gilead is his descendant, his son, so we can see there that we have Manasseh represented three different ways, or two different ways, I guess, but three different names that we have that are all from the tribe of Manasseh. And then we have um, uh, the gematria for these names. Now, we were, we were focusing upon uh, the fact that 216 and 162 show up. Now, it's not that unlikely because that was in the differentials, um, or, or pardon me, in the combined. So when you when you take uh, a reverse sum, let's say you have a name, the guy's name is A, and uh, obviously the normal sum would be 1, and the reverse sum would be 26. So it's going to add up to 27. So the combined are always going to be divisible by 27. So they're, they're just, uh, if, you, if you have a one-letter name, the combined is going to be 27. A two-letter name, it'll be uh, 54 right so so it's not that unlikely and so that would have to do with the number of letters in a name so if your name has uh, eight letters then you're going to have um, 216 as the combined gematria right if you have uh, six letters you're going to have 162 as the combined gematria right but what I, what I did here is I took um, each of these names and I looked at them um, and some in different ways. So we're just going to go through each of them. So Deborah, um, the Hebrew number 1683, the significance of that is 168 times 3 is um, uh, uh but, yeah, so 168 times 3 is the number uh, 504, right? So that's 504. And 504 is two time, is divided by 2 is 252. So 252 times 2 is 504. 
And so we have that symbol there in the name of Deborah. Deborah is the number of days in a week. Not days in a week. It's the number of hours in a week, 168, times three. Now, the factorization of the whole number, 1683, is 3 times 3 times 11 times 17, or 187 times 9, right? So factorization is just the factors. Uh, so it could be 9 times 187, right? Or 3 times 3 times 11 times 17 will give you that number. And that becomes significant in in other numbers that show up in this uh, analysis of this gematria. Now, now, one of the things I want to say about gematria, because you know we run into this as sort of numerology. So a person doesn't make decisions in their life based upon numbers. Now you're going to see numbers show up, and it best, and once you you know about a number as a symbol, you're going to notice it where numbers that aren't symbols, you're, you're not going to notice them, right? Now, we also have the peculiarities of math in the sense that each of these names in gematria, when we multiply them, uh, they produce these numbers that have all of these different divisors, right? So, uh, I mean, the bigger the number is, the more divisors it's going to have. A number that only is divisible by one in itself is called a prime number. And of course, if you're multiplying in gematria, you're never going to get a number that's a prime number, right? So, so I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, unless you, you know, your gematria is the person's name, name is uh, A, right? Or G or, you know, B, right? If you just had a one letter name like that, then you, you would have a, a prime number produced, but there isn't really any multiplication. So once you multiply uh, numbers together, you're going to get numbers that have lots of divisors. Um, <clears throat> so, so it can be deceptive sometimes when you're looking at coincidence of numbers, because some numbers are going to be very, very common. Some numbers are not. Um, now, so when we look at Deborah, we have this thing about her Hebrew number, and then we just look at now, I didn't do all the different things with Deborah. I just did the normal sum is 154. 154 is 2 times 77. When we it, were in Samuel Snow's letters, and we counted from uh, February 16th to July 18th, it's 154 ordinal days, right? Or it's 153 cardinal days, right? So we have the symbol 153, but we also have this symbol 154. And so 154 is just two times 77. So when I counted from February 16th and I counted 16 days and two months, or two months and 16 days to get to May 2nd, which was yesterday, but May 2nd, 1844, um, and that became the center of a chiasm where I counted two months and 16 days to get to July 18th. So, so in this, um, the numbers that are in Deborah's name here, okay, so we get the factorization, which we get 187 from uh, these numbers here, right, that this, this number 1683, we also know it's 168 times 3, which is 504 divided by 2, which is 252. We have the normal sum of the gematria of her name now, and that is 154. The reverse sum is 62, and the combined is 216. So we have the 62 weeks, right? We have the 154 days of Samuel Snow's letters. And we have the starting date of his first letter. So those are all symbolized here in the name of Deborah. Now in Barak, we had this significant number, the 1301, which we know if you multiply it by a thousand, it's the number of days 
from the first day of the first month in 1533 to the first day of the first month in 2030. And, and that's a period of uh, 3,562 years, which is divided by two is 1781. And 1781, if you look at, read it from the beginning, it's a mirror, right? But 178 and 187, which together are 365. And that's because from the from the spring equinox to the fall equinox is 187 days. And from the fall equinox to the spring equinox is 178 days. So that's 365 days. And the 1301 is the 112th prime number. So uh, the significance of that is obviously 2012, but we did some other things with that where we got, um, uh, well, one is we can look at 212 as February 12th, which would relate to, um, uh, it's going to be Odilio's study, I believe. I can't remember if it's fe February 12th is significant in some other way. Um, and then when we continue looking at uh, then the gematria of Barak, the normal sum is 33, the normal pro product's 396, and I bolded these, they're not necessarily um, numbers that we're used to seeing, but they are significant numbers. 11 times 3 is 33. Um, and then the reverse sum, we got 102. Um, so I just, I don't know. I, I shouldn't have bolded that one because I can't think of any significance of it. Um, but then we have the reverse product. Now, the reverse product is interesting because it's, and I took the zeros out, so I just bolded the, and here, maybe I'll make this look a little closer here. So I bolded this part, the first part, I took up the zeros. Now this is number here, wait, this is the one I want right here. Uh, divided by 13 is 187200. So that is, we know that uh, that mind calendar produces this number because it's the 13th Baktun. So we could break this down. Obviously, we could see we could uh, take 144 and divide this as well because it goes into 1872. Um, so there's different ways you can break these down, but we got this significance 18720 when we divide this number by 13. I think that's what we did, or was it this number? Maybe I, anyway, I can't remember if I added the zero in there. I think I did add one zero. And then we have um, the normal sum of, of um, Benjamin is 68. The normal product here, this normal product um, is 2293200. If we just take this part, it's 84, which is, of course, 7 times 12, times 273. Or it could be 91, which is 13, um, 13 times 7, right? So that's just 7 more than this one, times 252. So we can see that Benjamin also it has the symbol of 144 in it. And then with the reverse product, we get this really large number, which is equal to 187 times 252 times 2197. Now, 2197 is just 13 to the power of three. It's the number of days between um, uh, me and mine and Stephen's birthdays, right? From when we were born. And then, uh, the combined is 216. So we get all of these symbols here from um, Benjamin. And then with Ephraim, we have the normal sum is 70. Of course, 70 is uh, uh, an important number. The reverse sum is 11.9. So we get that symbol there. Um, we have the 189 as the combined, which is still, I think, probably significant. And then the differential is 49, that's seven times seven. McKeer, we have 52. That, of course, refers to um, what? What is 52 as a symbol? The 
The streets and walls were built in 52 days, right? Basically, the walls of Jerusalem built in 52 days. Now we have this normal. It's also connected to Nehemiah, three time or three plus forty nine. Yeah, right, exactly. And then you have this number five zero five four four. That's the normal product. Now it is if you divide it by twenty seven, you get one eight seven two. And so that twenty seven uh, becomes an interesting symbol because it's 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 the number when you combine. Uh, numbers, right? So it's the one that our combined number is divisible by. So if we divide that there, we get 1872. So that's pretty interesting there. Uh, the reverse sum is 110. So that can be the first uh, day of the 10th month. It can also be the 10th day of the first month. And then the reverse product is also divisible by 1872. But when you do, when you do that, you get 7182 which is July 1820. So you have those two, and but you divide, you multiply July 1820 by two. So in order to get this number, you can see how this one in Makir, this 1872 shows up, July 1820 20 shows up in various ways. Okay, but isn't also that reverse sum that you just mentioned half of the number of reunion? Um, yeah, the 110? Yes. 20, yeah. Yeah, so that, that you know, if we wanted to, we could, you know, go here. And we, yeah. we could do that. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so the number of floors on each of the buildings that fell at 9-11. Okay, um, so we got lots of interesting symbols there from Makir. Now Issachar, his normal sum is 78. Uh, we know 78 times 24, the number of hours in a day is 1872. Um, so we get that symbol there as well. And the, the combined is 216. Now there were some things I could do with the products and so forth, but I wasn't going to do all of them, just the more significant ones. Now, Reuben, his normal sum is 65. So we get this symbol here of the 65 years. I know Dwight had asked if any of them were 46, but we have the 19 and the 65 here, Reuben and Dan. Now, the normal product is 264600. You can see the 264 symbol there for this 26th day of the fourth month. And the reverse product is... This long number, which if it's divided by 390, you have the extra zero there, we get 2178, which is the, the four digits in 1872. The combined is 162. Then Dan, of course, is the 19. Reverse sum is 62, which of course refers to the 62 weeks. And the reverse product has the 777 in it times four, right? So this would refer to the 777 prophetic mirror. Uh, combined, it's 81, a symbol for midnight, and the differential is 43, 1843, right? So you can see we have lots of these symbols. Not everything is exactly a symbol, but we have lots of them. Now, Asher, okay, so then we got Gilead. So he, the normal sum there is 38. So 38 can be a symbol uh, that, that we've used. Um, so I probably should mark it, though. When we're looking at these symbols, I'm looking at how they relate to this line. Now, um, the normal product is a number that's divisible by six to be 20, 2520. So 2520 by six is this normal product. Um, and the combined uh, is 162. Then we have Asher, his normal sum is 51. But his product here, 13680, we can see that that's um, got the digits of the 1683 that we see in Deborah, right? those, those, those digits. It's in a different order, but it's still those digits. 
And, and then we have a reverse sum of 84, which is seven times 12. And then this reverse product produces a number that is uh, 1872. I guess I could have done it this way, just to be consistent. 1872 uh, times 209, 20th day of the ninth month times two will produce this number. And um, we see a differential there that's a 33 that we saw as um, in another place. Okay. And then we have Zebulun. His number is the 10th day of the first month or the first day of the 10th, 10th month, first day, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, and then the normal product is the number 1872 times 7 to the power of 3. So that's 777 times 3. The reverse sum is 88. That's a significant number. The reverse product is these exact same digits in Deborah's Hebrew number, but in reverse order. Instead of 1683, it's 13861, right? Uh, the combined is 189 because the number of letters in the name and uh, the differential is 13 the number of rebellion and then we have naphtali he's got um, midnight as his normal sum 81 um, and then the normal product if it's divisible it's divisible by 144 you get this number 2688 if you remember 2688 it's that uh, uh, American tax uh, form for the ap additional application of time, um, extension of time, whatever application, additional extension of time, which we counted from November 24th, from Thanksgiving of last year to April 5th, 2030. And then uh, the reverse product is this long number, which is uh, July 18.2, that is 7182. So July 18, 2020, um, times 13 to the power of three. Now, 13 to the power of three is 2197. That's, again, that's the number of, of days between mine and Stephen's birth. And then um, you multiply that by 22, the symbol for restoration. And the combined is going to be 216. And then the differential, 54, that's the fifth day of the fourth month. And then Manasseh, the normal sum is 80. It's just four score. Normal product is interesting one because it's 18772 divided by seven times two. So it's uh, so we have that seven doubled in there. And if you double the seven and divide it, um, uh, so I guess what I should have done is it should have been timed, not divided. Something's wrong there. Time seven. So one eight seven seven two times seven doubled. So it's seven doubled. Here seven is doubled in this number. It's but it's the one eight seven two. Um verse sum thirteen six. Verse product. It has just an interesting uh again, it has thirteen to the power of three just like we had in the one above, and um, which is the number of days between mine and Stephen's birth, times 19, that number there, 19, the 19 years, and then two to the power of 10, times 13 to the power of three. Okay. space there. Okay, so all of these symbols here, I mean, they exist here in these verses. What does that tell us about, about these verses? Uh, Judges chapter 5, verse 14 to 18. How does this help us place the arrival of the first angel? What does it tell us about the period of darkness? 
because this is just meant to help us understand uh, where we place this on this line. So we're saying this is the period of darkness. This is the children of Israel, right? We don't have Judah. We don't have Simeon. Those are in the south, right? Benjamin is what as well, but Benjamin also has territory that's sort of somewhat in northern Israel, even though it's later always associated with Judah. So we don't have Judah and we don't have... Um, Levi. Levi, right. Of course, the Levites <clears throat> here in this. So this is about this movement. That's how we're interpreting this. We see all these symbols of the July 18, 2020 prediction, symbols of Samuel Snow's letters, symbols of the 144,000. But mostly this is dealing with July 18, 2020 as a symbol. So I would say since this is the darkness, that this would be after July 18, 2020, at least. No disagreement on that. Okay. So, so we have all of these symbols. They're, they're tied to the, the symbols that relate to uh, the prophetic mirror, to the 777 structure, uh, to uh, things having to do with Ezra and Nehemiah, the divorce, um, the additional extension of time, um, the number of rebellion, uh, that's there, the 13, 13, 13. We have 11, 9 that's represented. Um, we have restoration that's represented. So, so all of these symbols are here. How does this help us as far as trying to know where the first angel arrives and what would we what we would mark as that arrival? Okay, so let's let's look at the the verses. So that's just dealing with an analysis of the gematria. We didn't really look too deep into the Hebrew numbers of the different tribes, other than Benjamin has the one four four in it, and Barak and Deborah definitely are significant in that regard. But I didn't I didn't spend time going through uh, um, you know one eight three five for Dan or anything like that. Okay, so, and there could be significance there, but I just didn't do it. A any thought about this before we move away from this, this page? To look at the scripture. I mean, we can come back to it if we need to. Okay. <clears throat> So when we looked at the, the meaning of the verses themselves, we can see that they're Deborah and Brack are singing the song. Some of the tribes came. Well, basically it's uh, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. They're the ones that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. But these other ones, they're not really involved, right? So, uh, they're going to be called out by Deborah and Barak in this song. And, and well, not all of them. Now, what about Makir, for instance? Now, we're saying that Makir is Manasseh. Right, and we're going to have Gilead there as well. So, so what is what is being described here? Why why are all these different tribes being mentioned? Makir has this. Um, uh, Are these something. representing different winds of doctrine that have been coming through the me the movement? Okay. Yes. Okay. 
So, so they definitely represent messages, and and probably the best way is winds of doctrine. That is, this this is in the movement, right? The movement is divided. We have these different tribes pulling in these different directions. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali, they're going to have the symbol of a, of the midnight cry there. Because 518 backwards is August 15th, right? Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Um, yeah, hazarding lives, that's Acts 15, 25 to 27. Um, let's see here, so... I don't know what those verses say. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have Barnabas and Paul mentioned there. So we, we see some parallel. Um, so if we're saying these are winds of doctrine, um, out of Ephraim there was a root against Amalek. And we looked at that as... Um, now, this idea of against Amalek, I need to look at this verse again in Hebrew. Um, so this is from Ephraim. Sheresh, that's the root. And it says in Amalek, right? Not really against. Right. Okay. So, so that means that Ephraim had a root in Amalek. And what would that mean? That Ephraim was accepting more of the idolatry which was condemned within Amalek and was fighting against what God had laid out for them. Right. So, so this is an enemy. So they have sympathy with the enemy in some way. Now, what would Amalek represent as, as a wind of doctrine? And we know about, you know, the destruction of Amalek. We know that um, Amalek is, um, what does Amalek do? Amalek is the one that attacks the children of Israel from behind. Right. He attacks the weak and the infirm. Right. So the question that I would have is Amalek representing the worldly educational system. Well, I think if well, I don't know so much that. I mean what I see is attacking from behind. I mean I understand what you're saying. But within this movement, um we have this backbiting going on. Right. Agreed. Right. Okay. And so this is this sympathy with this sort of spirit. The idea that we can just talk about people behind their back, point out their problems, uh, things in the past, gossip we've heard about them, distorted stories, misrepresentations of their character, of things they've said or done, instead of listening to what they're saying and evaluating what they're saying based upon God's word. Right. So it's pretty simple, simple idea there. And, and we see that Ephraim always has this problem where they say that they weren't called. Right. 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 But they were. But they were. <laughs> but they say they weren't. Right. So they're wanting to be involved in what's happening, but they don't want to be involved in what's happening. And then they want to talk schmack about it. Right. Yeah, exactly. 
So we can see that this represents a problem within the movement. Right now, um, so this is what we do, right? As a movement, this is a characteristic of this movement prior to a certain point. So this is a darkness that exists in the movement and we have a way mark where this is going to be addressed. So this is a part of the period of darkness. Now, after the Benjamin, so Benjamin's the son of the right hand. Um, now, and remember also Ephraim is where Deborah uh, lives, right? So she lives in Ephraim. So Ephraim, to some degree, largely represents the movement, the large body of the movement. So that's, that's one thing. Acceptable. That, yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. Okay. <clears throat> um, so it just says, after the Benjamin among the people. Now, um, now, the people here is just Am, right? So my people is Ami. I have a friend named Ami who's Jewish. Um, and there's we always hear about Lo Ami. That means not my people, right? There's a verse where it talks about that. But anyway, uh, so Benjamin has this symbol of the 144,000, right? It's 1144, but it has the 144 in it, in the, the number. And it's the son of the right hand. Um. And then it just has this word after, which is a car, it just means the hind part. So it's Benjamin is following after Ephraim, right? That's what it's saying among the people. So that there is, Benjamin is showing that there is a representation of the son of the right hand or the 144,000 that are following after Ephraim. Right? So they, they're somehow involved in this. So this is in our movement. This is us. right? And then it says, out of Macker came down governors. Now we, we can see here in this, um, this son of Manasseh, it's the word salesman right? or sold, it can be. Uh, and this word governors uh, means... Um, uh, to hack properly, that's the word, what it means, or to engrave, to be ascribed simply by implication to an act, either laws being cut in stone or metal tablets in primitive times, or generally prescribe, appoint, decree, governor, grave, lawgiver, note, portray, print, set. And we can see that this has to do with the lines themselves. This writing upon tables, this, this laying out of the lines. And and Makir um, says came down, that is descended. And out of that, so out of Makir, out of one of the son, the son of Manasseh, we have these governors, these people who are portraying these these lines, and out of Zebulun, um, they that handle the pen of the writer. So in this time, in this movement, there's all these things going on. And I would say that Makir and Zebulun, they are representing uh, things that are happening during the movement, not necessarily bad things, right? So not every one of these are representing bad things. They're representing different aspects of the movement. Some of them are bad. Some of them are good. Now, we know, of course, um, Zebulun and Naphtali were the people that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. So Zebulun, I would say here, is something that's happening in the movement in a good way. And I would believe that Makir as well. So both of them are representing this work that's being done during this time in this period of darkness. It's not all darkness, but it's div divided, right? Now, when it comes to Issachar, what is Issachar about? What's the symbol of Issachar? Book of Genesis, the blessing. What, what is his blessing?
you guys should remember. A strong ass couching down between two burdens, right? So Issachar represents what? He saw the rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. Islam. So, yeah, so it's about Islam and it's also about um, a chiasm, couching down between two burdens. Okay. Is Islam just a message? Yeah, Islam's a message, right? So there's a message about Islam. Right. So so we know that that Issachar represents that message. Okay. So when we look at it as a message, I mean, during that period of time, there is a message regarding Islam and in the structural chiasms. But it, it also, he says, and he saw the land, he saw the rest was good, right? So that word rest is, is just repro, repose. So, um, so this can be taken in different ways because this is basically ease. He saw that ease was good and the land, it was pleasant. So what is this showing about Issachar? And Angela says in the chat, um, Amalek can represent weakness of which we have blind spots, including self-justification of which Saul was guilty when greeting Samuel. Yeah, it definitely uh, represents that. Um, but we could say that Issachar represents um, this love of ease and pleasure. And because of that, Issachar becomes a servant unto tribute, it says. Now, it says that this word tribute, mas, Okay, seven times seven and seven plus seven. What What is that about there? Just the All verse right. numbers. Oh, the verse numbers? Um, okay, 914, 49.14, I mean. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so he saw the rest, it was good, the land that it was pleasant. So he loves ease and pleasure, but he bowed down his shoulder to bear. So he's going to be laboring, but he becomes a servant. Um, he becomes in bondage to tribute and tribute is properly a burden as causing to faint. That is a tax in the form of forced labor, right? So, so this is a message within the movement that loves pleasure and ease, but ends up having to bear a heavy burden. Okay. Now, as a question, well, yeah, question, but an observation to what what Iran had said as well. Yeah. Um, so Issachar is a strong ass, but the strong ass is represented as a male ass yes where we had a female ass earlier yeah. right so is instead of this being a religious symbol if it was a female ass this is more of a civil or 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 would we say organizational symbol um, well, it could be. I don't know if we have to take it that way. I okay. mean, just the idea here is Issachar is a strong ass, right? That is, it 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 has this ability to bear, and but it's going to couch down 
between two burdens. Correct. Right. So, I mean, I don't know what the two burdens are. We, one is we say that this represents the chiastic structure. Um, but is, is there it, anything else we can have that these two burdens are? Is it couching down between the two types of the 2520? Um, yeah, it just could be it could be burdened down because of the conflict that it was exists within the movement too. I mean, the Correct. word uh, mishpath burdens, and it's mishpaim, mishpaim, um, in the plural. Um, so that means a stall for cattle, only dual, right? Burden or sheepfold. So to me that this this has to do with um, this this message, right? So the sheepfold. This is the she Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. This is the sheepfold, and and so the idea of this word is it it's it's a dual word. Um, and if I can this way. Um, I don't know if that helps us. A braid that is bare, high, stick out, shafa. Um, so it can refer to saddlebags as well, fireplaces and ash heaps. Because we have the place mishpa. Um, but this is Issachar, right? So Issachar, uh, his name means he will bring a reward. But he has this burden. So the message of Issachar, uh, to me, seems to be someone who uh, loves ease and, ease and pleasure, but is going to have to bear a burden. And that burden comes from the fact that uh, they, they love ease and pleasure. So it's going to make it difficult for them, this message, people who are attached to this type of message, uh, to make a decision, right? So there's sort of an indecisiveness here. But I don't know particularly to a servant unto tribute unto this, whether they just end up following the crowd. I don't know what that would mean. Any thoughts on that? Maybe somebody has a better idea. So what exactly is tribute? Well, tribute is just a, a burden, forced labor. OK. Right, so uh, they, they just have this burden. It, it's also can be a tax in the form of forced labor. That is, right. you, have to, you have to do this work. You're forced to work. It's it's our tax burden, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the comment to what. Iran had posted in the chat. Seven by seven can also be written as seven squared. And the seven plus seven can be written as seven by two. Yeah. So in both ways, you involve the number seven and the number two. Mm -hmm. So is this <clears throat> symbol another indicative of the seven times and it's important in both the old and new testaments should be um, now now angela has a note there in the verse above issachar 
He's noted for having knowledge of the times. So where is that? Uh, that's First Chronicles 12, 32. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so, First Chronicles? Yeah. And what chapter? 12, 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Okay, so this is the mighty men that joined David. Okay, so Issachar in that verse has a knowledge of the times. Okay, so what would that mean then? Because in this period of darkness, we're going to have um, Issachar that knows the knowledge, has the knowledge of the times, right? Issachar. Now it says here, uh, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Even Issachar also Barak. So in this context here, Issachar is with Deborah. So Deborah represents the school of the prophets and Barak represents this understanding of chronology. So this makes sense that Issachar has an understanding of the times. But Issachar in in its character, loves ease and pleasure. And here it's going to be the princes of Issachar. Now, it doesn't make mention here that Issach the princes of Issachar uh, support Deborah and Barak other than in this song, right? Because we, we don't have Issachar mentioned otherwise. I would think that to be correct. Now, Issachar is mentioned in um, Judges 10 verse 1, <coughs> which we, of course, found significant when we studied that. Because we have uh, uh, Tola, son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. We have Issachar mentioned there. And that's going to be 10 verse 1. That's going to represent uh, the first day of the 10th month, right, in that line when we get there. But so, so Issachar here in this history is with Deborah and Barak. He has knowledge of the times, right? So it's a message that has to do with chronology. And then it says, why abodest thou among the sheepfolds? So remember, that's the word that we saw there in the blessing of Issachar. To hear the bleedings of the flocks. Now, these bleedings, um, the piping, the hissing, the whistling. Now, could this be the mocking that goes on towards uh, the message? Does that make sense in the context of what we've just said? We have, those that have we have those that have the knowledge of the times, 
And but it's Issachar. Issachar couches down between two burdens. Right. And and then it, it uses that same word there, like right? the sheepfolds, mispah, stall for cattle. So why are you why are you dwelling there? To hear the bleedings of the flocks. Right. So so we can look at those in the movement who are spending their time basically listening to this complaining that's going on. Does that sort of fit? Because I'm just I'm just taking this as what it's saying and trying to put it in into our lines. So this is all happening in this period of darkness because this message is going to address this period of darkness, the message of Deborah and Barak. And so this is a call to these different tribes, uh, basically calling them out during that time. Here's what you're doing. Right? That, that makes sense to people? It's logical. Now, and then we have for the divisions of Reuben. So this word divisions just means a section, division. Uh, so the word divisions, six months, 391 years. Okay, uh, that's just the word divisions there. You can see the six months, that's 391 and a half. Just the word divisions as the Hebrew number. That's what Iran is pointing out. Now, Reuben uh, here, he's the son of Jacob. We know that he's the eldest. Um, uh, and they were great in at that. There were great. That's Gadol, searchings, um, examination or enumeration or deliberation. Finding out, number, search of heart. And of course, that's going to be lab. Uh, also use figuratively for our feelings, um, all kinds of different things, understanding, wisdom. Just so, so it says that there was this message that was searching out numbers. It is great understanding. That's Reuben. Now, Reuben's not going to be involved in, in the message that follows as a symbol. But here we can see during this time, we have all of these characteristics. We have different emphasis, different groups of people. Now, Gilead abode beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? So... They're not involved in what's going on. Asher continued on the seashore and abode in the breaches, which Dwight noted was like the creeks. But that's just what they mean by the breaches is that place along the shore where you have these creeks come down um, and, and a breach um, is uh, a break in the shore, right? So that's where you have the, the creeks come. It's a break in the shore. So, so here we have these different tribes, Gilead, Dan, and Asher, not involved. And then we have 518. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. So, so this is leading, this is this period of darkness. This is what's happening in this movement. So we're going to have a point where uh, we're going to have this battle, right? The kings came and fought then, fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo that took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kaishan swept them away, that ancient river, 
the river Kaishan, right? Remember, Kaishan is this winding river. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancing, prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye Marats, says the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Now, Ellen White says a lot about Marats. Marats. Um, and we're going to look at that. So now we have to say these verses here, I, I would take as representing a waymark, the arrival of the first angel. Now, maybe maybe they refer to more than that. Maybe it's the first waymark in its formalization or something like that. But, but we need to decide what this is. So we need to know what the darkness is and what message arrives and what symbols there are to show us when this arrives. Now, we know when we look at JL in the other lines, this is going to represent um, uh, this message related to July 18, 2020. But we know that, that this whole line is referring to something after July 18, 2020. But it's, it's, it's including these symbols here. So we have to figure out what that means. So any suggestions where we have this first angel arrive after this period of darkness? So normal places we would put it, you could put it at December 25th, 2021. You could even put it later, maybe. You have, we have to figure out what, what's, what, why are we, where would we put this and why? Any suggestions? Dan and Asher, the observers, that's what I would say. People on the periphery of this movement, that's, that's what I would think about it. There are a lot of people on the periphery of the movement. People aren't really involved. There always is the observers waiting to see what's going to happen. Gilead as well. So, so we have this movement. We have all of these characteristics of the people in this movement. It represents the message of this movement, July 18. All of these things are represented. But now we have to say, where do the kings come and fight against the kings of Canaan? What is Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo? Now, so um, so what is Tanakh? Yeah. Or where is it? What is? Well, I don't know what the word means because they say it's of unknown or uncertain derivation. So it doesn't, we don't have any idea to know what the word means. Uh, the first time it's mentioned is in Joshua 12, 21. Um, so what's 12 times 21? Everybody knows what 12 times 21 is. <laughs> 252, right? All right. So... So all we can get, because of the law of first mention, we look at that first, we can say it must represent the 2520. Now, it's also mentioned in Joshua 17, 11. What's 17 times 11? 184 or 187. 187. Sorry. It's also in Judges 127. What would 127 mean? Is that July 21, midnight? Right. 
Right. So you can see Tanakh shows up in these verses here. The first three times it shows up, it represents the 2520, July 18th, and midnight. Right, July 21st. Okay, but no, you, you just made a, a quick omission. You took Joshua 1221, understood. Joshua 1711, yes. Judges 127, yes. Yeah. But when you look at Joshua 2125, which is the third verse, yeah. in the list, your multiple on that one comes out at 525. Okay, right. So I was going to look at that one. But uh, now, so it's also December 25th. Okay. Right. Just taking 21 backwards. But yes, we get 525, where uh, 525 goes from uh, July 18th, 2020 to December 25th, 2021. And so... So those three verses in Joshua, uh, Joshua give us 252, 187, and December 25th, 2021, right? And Judges 127 gives us midnight. Right. Okay. So, so we probably should put this in somewhere. Um, but we'll do the ones from Joshua. We'll put that on this chart. So what we want to do is we want to take Joshua. Well, first we'll write in Tanakh. How do you spell Tanakh? T and like that. D double A N A C H. A double A. Right. Okay. But it's interesting as as you were as you're you're showing here right now Hebrews or the Hebrew eighty five ninety that there's seven occurrences or is that a looking at a different word altogether? Um, yeah. So what your uh, so right, si right side of your screen? Yeah. So there's seven verses, seven times it shows up in the Bible. That's that's what that means. So um, so Tanakh shows up seven times. So we'll just put here seven times. The meaning I got for that word is who humbles thee. Where did you get that from there? Where where'd you get it? I just Google everything. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, because the dictionaries say they don't know where it came from or what it means. So that might be a guess that someone has. What does Canaan mean? Um, well, it's named after, uh, uh, anyway, I'm doing this. So can somebody look up, answer her question? Can I'm looking at, at, at several things on this right now. Yeah. Because in, in some areas, this is being regarded as one of the royal Canaanite cities. And we would take that from Joshua 12, 21, 1 Kings 4, 12, and 1 Chronicles 7, 29. The one y'all looking at is Canaan. Yes, do you have the meaning? Uh, 
And depending on, on who or the source being used, some are saying that Tanakh would mean Sandy. Yeah. I don't think much of that helps us. We don't know where the word comes from. Um, so, but, but the numbers here that we have, so I'll show you this again. So when we look at what I drew here, judges, so we got Tanakh seven times it occurs. It occurs in Joshua 1221. 12 times 21 is 252, not 25. And then it occurs in Joshua 17, verse 11. 17 times 11 is 187. It occurs in uh, Joshua 21, 25, um, which uh, equals 525. And of course, you can see that you can take these numbers and put them into December 25th, 2021. And Judges 127 gives you July 21st. So we're saying that that's where the battle is. So the symbols that we have, wouldn't those point us at December 25th, 2021? I would think that would be a case. Yeah. Okay. So... I agree. So the, to me, that's kind of what we see by that battle. Mm -hmm. Get this way. So we've got December 25th, 2021. We say the first angel arrives there. And that makes sense for what we see in this darkness. So we have all of this stuff in that line of that 777 structure in that story. But now we come to December 25th, 2021, and we come to this battle. This battle is described as being here, right? December 25th, 2021, in the Song of Deborah and Brack. And the Song of Deborah and Brack is a repeat of history Right? Because it, it's it's repeating, telling again the story of Deborah. Right, a reiteration, right? Yeah, exactly. So so our history since December 25th, 2021 is a reiteration of the history that went before. And it, and it's leading us somewhere, right? So this is this is about a darkness that existed. That darkness exists in um, this movement. I, I don't know if Canaan mean to be humbled. I don't think so. What about Canaan? Well, just Roseanne asked if it means to be humbled. I don't know. Well, um, the the Brown Driver Briggs gives it the application of lowland. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's key kit not on lowland. So this. Land west of the Jordan. Um, I have a meaning to be brought down. Yeah, because um, it, it has this, this term, uh, the root means properly to bend the knee, hence to humiliate or vanquish, bring down into subjection under humble self or subdue so um but in this case the idea is not so much that it's humbled to be humbled it's humbles that it is it's um it humbles others it doesn't humble itself right. 
So it depends on, uh, but that's where it comes from. It comes from that word, which means to bend the knee. So it could be the land of subjection. But these are the kings of Canaan in Tanakh. So this, uh, by the waters of Megiddo. So we're all familiar with Megiddo. Megiddo means a rendezvous. Um, the place of crowds, an ancient city of Canaan assigned to Manasseh and located in the southern rim of the plain of Esdralon, six miles from Mount Carmel and 11 miles from Nazareth. Right. And Megiddo uh, comes from the word to crowd, also to gash, assemble, gather together. Gadad. Okay. Purchaser and possessor for Kainan. That's a different word, but it's related. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, this is where the battle is being fought. Now, it's the kings of Canaan, and, and the reason that we have this is it's Jabin, king of Canaan, right? And Sisera, right? So that's, that's the enemy. Now, we said that this, this Sisera continues in the movement. So even though Parminder is defeated, there still is the teachings of Parminder, the attitudes of Parminder, the spirit of Parminder still exists within the movement, even though some people find that offensive to say that. It seems pretty obvious that we haven't unlearned things that, that, that we have learned that are part of our nature, that have existed with us our entire lives. We're not truly converted. And so... Um, this battle then um, for the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart or searchings of heart, resolution, thought, decree. Um, we can see that this is, um, you know, when we're addressing that, that part back there with Reuben, we can see that all through this time, this movement is divided, yet there are good things about some of the tribes. But there's going to be this battle. And Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. And the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan. So we have this doubling. They came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan. So this word is doubled here now um, I'm just looking at here these words so the kings of Canaan uh, then came the kings of Canaan They fought, and at that time they fought. So they say then fought at that time. Um, the Melek, a king, a king of Canaan um, in Tanakh. So this word Tanakh is, is telling us that this battle occurs on December 25th, 2021. That's where it starts. The first message arrives. But it's also Megiddo, right? Megiddo or Megiddo? Megiddo. Same, same place. It's, it's Armageddon. Right? Okay. It's, it's the same, same thing. So um, they took no gain of money, right? So 
So, so what is this a reference to? This, this seems like a rather sort of odd reference, just the way it's, it's, it's worded. So they didn't they didn't take any plunder, according to Jameson Fawcett Brown. De describes the battle, the scene of battle and the issue. It would seem in Judges 519 that Jabin was reinforced by the troops of other Canaanite princes. The battlefield was near Tanakh, now Ta'anuk, on a tell in the mound by the level of the plain of Megiddo, now Legion in its southwestern extremity by the left bank of the Kaishan. So this is where the battle is. My meaning I got from Megiddo is his precious fruit declaring a message. Okay. Well, I know it means rendezvous. So um, it's a place of crowds, and I don't see anything there about fruit or anything so so I'm not sure why they're why they're giving that definition <clears throat> so it's by the waters of Megiddo Mayim is waters that's used for sea and other things um, so it says they took no gain of money they fought from heaven the stars in their courses fought against Sisera right so so they that took no gain of money who is that This is talking about Zebulun and Naphtali, is it not? Good point. Okay. So Zeb Zebulun and Naphtali, they're not doing this for, for spoil. They're, they're risking their lives. They're fighting against the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. So this is like the Battle of Megiddo, in this rendezvous. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses, and of course this would refer to, um, to the chronology. All right. And, and we're going to have um, fought doubled here as well, right? So they fought from heaven. That's going to be Zebulun and Naphtali. The kings of Canaan fought, right? The kings, of came, came, the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tana by the waters of Megiddo, right? They took no gain with the money. That's Zebulun and Naphtali, those messages. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. So this is the time, right? We know that Sisera is the message of Parminder. But now we're looking at this repeat of history. This is the message of Parminder, not at 11.9, but at December 25th, 2021. Right? That makes sense. Right? Because even though Parminder was defeated, his message still continues. It's still there as darkness. His message and the attitude of his message. Right. The attitude of his message. The way in which things are approached, especially when it comes to the problems that exist in the movement. The divisions that exist in the movement. Now, so I'm going to say that, you know, we take uh, verses. Uh, now, we could probably put 18 to 20, because yeah, even though 18 we included in that period of darkness, we're going to say that this is where the battle is fought. 
right? So, I mean, you could say it's 19 and 20. Um, now it says in verse 21, the river Kaishan swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. So again, you have this doubling, the river Kaishan. O my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Um, strength being Oz. And um, trodden down the rock to tread. Now, the river Kaishan, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. So you got river three times in that verse. Are each time representing the river Kaishan? Yeah, so the river Kaishan that swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. And what do we take from the name of Kaishan? Well, it means winding. Um, the first time it's mentioned is in Judges 4, verse 7. Um, so that's applied together, that's 28. Yeah. And, Judges, and that's also the four seven times. Yeah. And Judges 4, 13, it's mentioned again. Um, and again, of course, Judges 5.21, it's mentioned twice, Kaishan itself. And that's where Elijah is going to take the prophets and kill them. He brought them down to the brook Kaishan and slew them there. Well, okay. With the prophets of Baal. On that with Kaishan, on the first one that we mentioned, we have the four seven times, right? Yeah. The second one that you mentioned, you said 413? Yeah. Okay. So if we multiply four by 13, we come up with 52, right? Yeah. Now, as we are aware in our study of the allowing the land to rest. Wouldn't the 52nd year have been the first year of harvest after the land had rested in the 50th year? No. That's not how it works. Well, the 49th year, they were still... Yeah, so you have two years of rest, the 50, the 54, the 50th year is the first year of the cycle. Okay. So the 51st year would be the first year of harvest. Okay. I thought that was the first year of planting. Well, you harvest when you plant. All right. Yeah. I stand corrected. Yeah. yeah the plant harvest is just, you know, four or five months later. Okay, so, um, and then we have 1 Kings 1840. So we have July, uh, August 11th, 1840 symbolized there. 521 is uh, 105, five times 21. Right? Okay, so the 52, would that have been the, the number of days it took to reconstruct the wall. Yeah. That's the time they used to reconstruct the walls of, of Jerusalem in the story of Nehemiah. Okay. So we have the seven times followed by the reconstruction of the wall. Yeah. Followed then by 1840. Well, and we also have the 10th day of the fifth month. That's the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. 105. Okay. And yeah, and then August 11th, 1840. And then we have Psalms uh, 83, verse 9, which is going to talk about Sisera. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, 
as to Jabin at the book Kaishan. So in Psalm 83, 9, um, it's just using these uh, examples. This is a song, uh, a psalm of Asaph, talking about the enemies, right? Um, all these different enemies. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin at the book of Kai, book of Kaishan. So here, um, referring to the Midianites. Um, I'm not sure what reference that is, why they're mentioning the Midianites here at the River Kaishan, because I don't know that it, it happens here. Well, we're going to have to look at this a little closer tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, a, a very interesting. Uh, I've got a question, Theodore. Yeah. So... Um... On your e-sword, I noticed yeah. you were uh, had um, a Hebrew um, lexicon uh, translation that you were using earlier. What's what's the name of that? Is that a premium one or is that one of the free ones? Okay, that was just one of the commentaries. It was a commentary. Yeah. It, it, Okay, because it kind of looked like it was, uh, you know, a Hebrew uh, Bible, and you were touching oh, I, on the. I have the Hebrew Old Testament. And, okay, where, what, what's the, what's the, um, the three-letter digit or three-letter classification on your file there? O T, o -T plus. O T O T plus. Yeah. Thank you. He Hebrew O T plus, right? So it's just. Okay, anyway, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. For each person, we pray that you can bless them today. And thank you for the things you are teaching us. Help us to understand these symbols, even though they can be at times difficult to remember. Um, help us to apply them correctly. Um, bring us together again uh, tomorrow, according to thy will. And watch over each person we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.